Amen. Good morning, and thank you all for coming. We're going to uh, continue on a series that I have begun uh, on memorial stones, and we are actually looking at the history of our church and our fellowship, where we came from, and we are looking especially at, in many places, uh, why we do what we do. So I'm going to continue that on uh, today. I want to get our main verse, Joshua 4, 4 through 7. Then Joshua called the twelve men whom he had appointed from the children of Israel, one man from every tribe. And Joshua said to them, Cross over before the ark of the Lord your God in the midst of the Jordan, and each one of you take up a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, that this may be a sign among you, when your children ask in time to come, saying, What do these stones mean to you? Then you shall answer them, that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it crossed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be for a memorial to the children of Israel forever. Okay, so this is where the title of the series comes from, is these stones were something that they would look back to and uh, line up with even uh, in uh, ongoing days. So that is the basis of this series. We want to talk about pre-fellowship history. We're actually going to go backwards a, a little bit, and I'll explain why. We always speak of our fellowship and we count the beginning of our fellowship from 1970 and of course that is when uh, my parents took the church in Prescott. We do that partly because it is true. Everything changed when uh, my father took over the, uh, the church in Prescott. He opened the door to uh, hippies. He led us into evangelism outside the four walls, and then, of course, the direction of our church was for discipleship and church planting, and that was completely different than Foursquare. They did not want the path that we were going down, and that ultimately led to a, a separation. We'll talk about that later on. So partly that's why we do say it started in 1970, but there's actually a very practical reason why we do that as well, and that was when my father took over the church, there was no information about the past. There were no records. It wasn't like people kept photographs and, and uh, there was no written records of what the church uh, was. And of course, there was no computers in the, that, those days, no internet. My dad couldn't Google it. He never could if he wanted to, but it didn't exist. That wasn't, uh, that wasn't an option. I have had three photos from the past, and I got those after Dad died. So Dad just had no uh, information on the past. The only information that my dad actually knew about the church from the past was that somewhere in the past, Chuck Smith who then later on founded Calvary Chapel, used to be the pastor. He knew that a friend of his, Fred Cowan, had pastored the church. And then the man he took over from was a man named Sherman Smith. That is essentially all he knew. So we had no way of uh, telling any story or connection from the past. So, but when we say we started in 1970, that is true for our fellowship, but we didn't spring up like a mushroom from nowhere, is that that is actually technically incorrect because the church in Prescott did exist before my parents took over, and it was originally a four-square church. And so I want to go back in time. Now I have an advantage that Dad didn't have, is I can Google the past, and I have uh, found it. So I'm going to tell you a bit of the story of our church from the Foursquare uh, perspective leading up to 1970. The Foursquare Gospel Church was started by a lady named Amy Semple McPherson. We have pictures of her. She was a very flamboyant uh, evangelist. She's from Canada. And uh, so she ministered another picture in later years of Amy Semple McPherson. This woman made incredible impact in America. 
they say that she had the most widely publicized meetings of her time. She did experience powerful healings, prayed for the sick. She was very fiery uh, evangelist. And then the uh, previous picture that you saw there was a building that she built after traveling and began to have so much success, she wound up building a building in Los Angeles, California, and it was called Angelus Temple. It seated 10,000 people, and the building was uh, packed. So she founded the Foursquare Gospel Church. Now, that's a funny name for us today. Foursquare is a website, uh, you know, selling things in different... Foursquare gospel was, she was saying, there are four foundations to the gospel. That is Jesus Christ as Savior, healer, baptizer in the Holy Spirit, and soon coming king. Foursquare gospel churches, they were Pentecostal. And then the soon coming king, they believed in pre-tribulation rapture. And so you understand that historically... Pentecostals who believe in the rapture generally are the most evangelistic. And so that is exactly what happened. People who were impacted by the Foursquare Gospel Church witnessed and they spread. They wanted to spread the gospel. They started churches throughout the United States. Later on, they uh, started churches overseas. And then, of course, as it affects us, they started a church in Phoenix, Arizona. And it was in Phoenix, Arizona in a Foursquare Gospel Church. I showed you pictures of that in previous lessons. That is where my parents were saved. They were born again in 1953. Is my parents were saved after the death of their, uh, their first daughter. Uh, their hearts were opened. My uncle George and Aunt Ione they were uh, members of the Foursquare Gospel Church in Phoenix, Arizona, invited them. That is where my parents were saved. That is where my father was filled with the Holy Spirit. In Prescott, Arizona, the earliest mention that we have of Foursquare in Prescott is in 1932. We have through now, you can go back every edition of the Courier even in its previous uh, existence, you can find this. This is the earliest mention of Foursquare in Prescott, Arizona, 230 and a half South Montezuma, that's Whiskey Road. This would be basically the shops across the street from where the Salvation Army is. Is these two men, I don't, and I'm, I'm gonna tell you names of people, I don't know anything about them, these men were trying to bring the Foursquare Gospel to Prescott, Arizona. P.F. Morrell and Brother Bressy, uh, they were laboring together to try to build a work here, and that is in 1932. That is the earliest mention of Foursquare. was actually st started in 23, so a mere nine years later, someone was trying to bring Pentecostal uh, power to, to Prescott, Arizona, reading between the lines, these men, they were breaking ground. I gather that the work did not go well because in the Foursquare records, they count the church as starting in 1936. So that tells me that these men, they were, they were pioneering, they were trying, they're breaking ground in Prescott, but apparently they were not successful in establishing uh, a lasting church in uh, then moving on in, in 1935 the, the courier records that Amy Semple McPherson came to Prescott Arizona this made the news uh, this was notable as I said she was the most famous evangelist in America at that time and so in little old Prescott Arizona she, uh, we don't have time to read it all out, but what it was is they were having a convention in Phoenix, and so she decided to visit every Foursquare work, including this work that the men were trying to build in Prescott, Arizona. 
I told you before that we did not know anything about the past. My father always told me a vague story. What he had heard passed down through time was that there was a man who pioneered the church, who built a building, and in his mind what he had been told was that the man sold the building to Foursquare. I've actually been able to find it. We have an article that refers to this. Next photo here. This is actually 1961, but it tells us something here that it's 25th anniversary in 1961. So in 1936, it was founded by Reverend Wyla. And it tells us here that a tabernacle, he started in a tent and then built a tabernacle, meaning a temporary uh, a building of some kind on Miller Valley Ro Road, sold that, and then uh, what, what dad had heard is this man had construction skills that he built the building at 606 Lincoln uh, Street on which we first uh, occupied when my parents came in 1970. So this is what Foursquare, they actually marked, that's why I say the original men, it probably didn't go well, but God bless them, they were trying to break uh, ground in, in Prescott. So 1936, Reverend Wylop, he and his wife came and they were able to uh, build this. The next photo we have, this is a notice of a revival on that building in uh, Lincoln and what it tells us then, and part I'm gonna name the year that I find the mention, I don't know exactly when each person started and ended their ministry, but in 1937, this was a very four square thing to do. They sent two women as the pastors here and uh, Mary Alice Bridges and Adelaide D. Mills, they were the ones after the man built the building. Uh, apparently he must have had some money and he would sell it to four square and then he would move on. He had probably had a pioneering uh, spirit and I gather that he did that in other places. The next mention in the Courier is this is 1938, and the pastor was a reverend and Mrs. B.H. Goldsberry. Again, I don't know anything about these people, but they were laboring now from 38 uh, and apparently maybe up until 1940. And uh, then uh, we get to the, the next uh, mention. Next one. This tells us at this time uh, they had, uh, there was someone named Ernest McGrew in there. Some of these people were only here like for a year at a time. This tells us in 1942 now is Reverend W.C. Huffman was the pastor in uh, 1942. Next picture, 1946. Now the pastor is S.L. Tyler, husband and wife. They were both pastoring uh, the, the church, and so this is uh, the listing here is 1946. Next photo, this is Chuck and Kay Smith. Uh, I've told you a little bit about them. He, of course, later on founded Calvary Chapel. This was 1947. Uh, they got married in his autobiography, How I Know It's 1947. I don't find that in the Courier from his biography. Uh, he says that right after they got married, just uh, like a month after getting married, they came to take the church in Prescott, Arizona. And why did they come to Prescott? Because Kay Smith, her sister, uh, was uh, Louise Webster, who they called E.C. E.C. Webster was the pastor of the church when my father got saved. They were sisters, and Louise Webster was the district supervisor, so they uh, encouraged them to come. So Chuck Smith was the pastor here from one year, uh, for one year from 1947 uh, to 1948. Next picture is we have a man named Charles W. Smith. This is 1949 is when I find the article. He probably started in 1948 sometime. Next picture. John L. Martin, this is in 1950. He was the pastor uh, of the church. And uh, then I see the next man. 
the next picture, it tells us here of someone arriving to take over the bottom, says Reverend and Mrs. Ernest McGrew. This is sometime in the 50s. It doesn't specify the exact timing. The McGrews are leaving to go take a church in Texas, and uh, Reverend and Mrs. Edie Hardwick came from Los Angeles to take the church, and that was sometime in the uh, early 1950s, those two couples. Next picture, John H. Gleason, and uh, I find this uh, mentioned in 1959 is when this was a, many of these are just church notices in the evening courier, the daily courier, whatever the paper was called at that time. Next one, 1962, is a man named James R. Cron. He was the pastor in the early uh, 1960s. So all of these, I cannot tell you, I can't find any information on them. I don't know anything about their ministry, but we are simply recognizing each of them. Then we come, 1963, now we get to someone that I do know. And the next picture here, this is Fred and Laverne Cowan and their family that they came to Prescott in 1963. Very, very important. I'm actually in a couple of, uh, uh, maybe in, in two more weeks, I'm going to expand and tell you more about Fred Cowan. Fred and Laverne were in the same church. They were saved in Phoenix, Foursquare, that my parents were uh, saved in. And so, they were uh, friends with my parents. I, I re, you know, we had dealings. I remember them uh, as kids, but I'm going to tell the story later on. Fred was the one who opened the door for Australia, and I'm going to tell that story in later time. But in, as I said with everyone else, I can't tell you anything about their ministry, but I have a very powerful picture. Something happened when Fred Cowan was a pastor. Next picture. And that is, uh, well, here, first of all, is just a, uh, a miracle film. I, 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 many of you know that my father loved the supernatural because they saw T.L. Osborne miracle films. T.L. Osborne would film his crusades. This is the first interest that my father had in healing. Fred Cowan also had a supernatural touch on his life, and uh, he did the same when he came here. This is an advertisement that Fred Callen as the pastor is showing a T.L. Osborne uh, film. So they were here from 63 to 67. Next picture. This is a very powerful picture. Someone got saved when Fred Callen was a pastor. That is our very own Ike Cook who got saved under Fred Callen's ministry. Amen. Isn't that wonderful? Is Opal had been going to church and Ike was a hard-headed sinner and finally came, got saved. Here he is. This is actually in uh, the pool at Ike's house in Chino Valley. Fred Cowan baptized Ike Cook. And so that is powerful to us in the Prescott Church because Ike and Opal were pillars of our church for many years. Ike Cook was the one, such a blessing in the tent ministry in so many different ways, helping churches throughout the fellowship and in a lot of different ways. But the impact, so that is something that I can tell you about Fred Cowan's ministry in Prescott is that Ike Cook was saved under uh, his ministry. 1967, the Cowans then left uh, for Australia, and I'll tell that story in a couple of weeks. Next photo. This is the, uh, remember I showed you this photo, this is the land, this is actually something else that Fred Cowan did. That land is our Ruth Street building. Fred Cowan was the one who had the foresight. He was the one who originally purchased the property during his time as a uh, pastor of the Foursquare Church. This is, they're dedicating the land, it looks like they're uh, having a building dedication, but they weren't building yet. They didn't, they didn't build until 72 when my parents came. The man in the middle with the gray suit and the red tie, his name is Sherman Smith. Sherman and Elaine Smith were the immediate predecessors to my parents. They pastored here from 1967 to 1969. And then the final pastor of Prescott Foursquare Gospel Church, 
This is actually the announcement in the paper, 1970, when Pastor Mitchell came. So here is my point. Uh, for many years, we just didn't refer to the past because we didn't know it. We had no connection. Let's get a scripture. This is why I am taking time to remember the past. It's the principle found in John 4, 37 and 38. For in this the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. Others have labored and you have entered into their labors. Okay, this is the Bible principle is we always benefit from previous labors. So here, so the, the, the Bible says some people, all they do is sow. They sow, they don't get to see the big crop. So all of those names that I read to you or the articles that, or the pictures that I show, we owe those people. Because those people, again, I don't know their ministries. I don't know, I can't, can't tell you about except for, uh, you know, Cowan and a little bit of... Uh, uh, Chuck Smith, I don't know anything about them personally, but they prayed for Prescott. And they would have sowed seed. And because of that, when my father came, he was a great man, but he didn't do this by himself, is that the benefit of the past, it was Reinhard Bonnke that he uh, was doing a crusade in Malawi. In Malawi, David Livingston labored for years and never saw large numbers at all for all of his labors that he did in Malawi. Malawi. 150 years later, Reinhard Bonnke did a crusade that 150,000 people came out. That's a pretty healthy crowd. And he said, as he's looking out over this massive crowd, the Holy Spirit spoke to him and said, you are walking on the tears of former generations. And that is a Bible principle. So I want to take the time and recognize every pastor, every laborer in the Foursquare Gospel Church in Prescott, Arizona. We owe them and we reap the benefit. We need to thank God for all of their labors today. God, we thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for their faithfulness, Lord God, and that we reap the benefit. Okay, so having talked about the past, now let's continue the story. Last week, we had, we had begun with church planting. So I want to talk about some church planting milestones and lessons. When we first started planting churches, it was all within Arizona. All the churches we planted to begin with, it was Wickenburg, Flagstaff, Tucson, Nogales, uh, and then we moved on to Cottonwood and some other places here, Phoenix, and, uh, and we moved on. So we kept planting churches, and then we have milestones along the way, and that is the first church was planted in New Mexico. Young man got saved on Lincoln Street, uh, Ernie Lister. Ernie Lister was a uh, uh, Navajo uh, Indian, and when he got saved, he came in, was powerfully transformed, but he decided that he wanted to go to a Native American Bible school, so he left, and I, I think the Bible school was in Phoenix. He did this. This was in the tremendous move of God that originally happened, but that's what he felt he wanted to do, and uh, so he did. In his own words, later on, Ernie Lister said, I learned more in the first two months of being in the Prescott Church than three years of Bible school. So he finished Bible school, started, he was doing, um, I can't remember, youth pastor or something in, in a church in New Mexico, and he finally realized, I have made a mistake, came, drove to my dad's house, and apologized for leaving. My father didn't rebuke him, didn't berate him. He simply said, Ernie, you need to get a hold of God and find out what God wants for your life. And he said that he spent uh, apparently three days uh, praying and seeking God, and God told him, go to Gallup, New Mexico. He drove to Gallup, New Mexico by himself, walked around it, believing that God 
wanted him to be there. He was claiming Gallup, New Mexico uh, for God, and he wound up finding uh, a little building on the wrong side of town. We actually have a picture uh, of this building. Now it's True Vision Optical. But when he found this building and saw that it was available to rent, the only problem was he had no money. Drove back to my father's uh, house, you know, my parents' house, and, and told my father what God said to him, which is start in Gallup, New Mexico. And he said, and I found a building that we can rent. My dad went and got the money, gave him the money, and he was able to rent that building. That is where the church in Gallup, New Mexico uh, first started. We have uh, some photos uh, of the, the, the past here. Here's the first band. There's Bobby Montoya, and uh, this is Jerry Bertinetti playing guitar. Jerry's still playing guitar. I think he started when Noah got off the boat. He's still playing today. And uh, I think we have uh, more pictures here is we have an early uh, Artie Aragon, and there's John Robinson in the middle. Uh, here's Perry Shorty. And so these are all, they were saved now, uh, ministering for God, and that came from our very first church in Gallup, New Mexico. A very powerful lesson came out of Gallup, New Mexico, and had to do with morning prayer meetings a mark of our fellowship, every one of our fellowship churches, uh, well, they're supposed to anyway, we have morning prayer meetings, and sometimes you ask, why do we pray in the morning? I told you in one of the very first lessons, when my father got saved, powerfully converted, he just wanted to pray. He knew he needed, a God, uh, needed God, and so he started praying uh, in a shed in, in behind the house in Phoenix, Arizona until it got too hot. Then he would come in and uh, kneel on the tile floor in the bathroom, put the toilet seat down, and he would pray in the morning. He started his day with prayer. He always did this personally, but in each church he would take over. They had existing prayer meetings that generally were Wednesday nights, and I told how he changed that in one of the churches to midweek service. That's where we get our midweek service from. When he took the church in Prescott, my father continued, but for whatever reason, morning prayer was 10 o'clock in the morning. Now, for all of you that sleep in, you say, praise the Lord. <laughs> the, the practical drawback, my father's gonna pray no matter what time it is. My father prayed every day. But the practical drawback, as young people got saved and they wanted to pray, when they got jobs, 10 o'clock was not very convenient for working men to be able to go to prayer meetings. Uh, some of the guys, I remember, uh, I think it's Roger Fisher and, and different ones have told me that if they work construction, occasionally they were able to slip in and pray at 10 o'clock. But it wasn't very convenient the church in Gallup, New Mexico, apparently they had tried various times to have prayer meetings, and they finally settled on having morning prayer meetings. I don't know if it was seven or six or whatever, but, but Dad, when he went and preached there and went to morning prayer, he said, of course, what a logical time to have prayer meeting is before work, and in fact, it's actually biblical. Psalm 5, verse 3. My voice you shall hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning I will direct it to you, and okay. I will look up. So that's a Bible principle. Is It's a good thing to pray in the morning. It's a good thing to start your day with prayer before your day gets messed up. Wouldn't it be better? Preventative prayer would be better than, Lord, everything's a mess. Now I need you to help me. So when dad saw this, he came back and he changed the time and forevermore from that day, our prayer meetings are seven o'clock in the morning. Of course, people who start earlier come earlier, but we have continued that. That would have been probably 1985, 86. We've had prayer uh, or 75, 76. We've had prayer uh, ever since at seven o'clock in the morning. We have another uh, milestone. And that is the first time that we ever...
pioneer in Cottonwood, Arizona, and so that is a milestone. The next lesson that we learn is the truth of church changes. Some of the things that you might have seen through the years that are quite normal, everything was new. 1975, God began to stir Ron Jones, who had gone to Pioneer and Flagstaff. God moved on him to leave Flagstaff and to Pioneer in Sierra Vista, Arizona. Sierra Vista, we got some photos here. That's kind of an aerial view. Fort Huachuca, there's, of course, it's military, and that was uh, in uh, Sierra Vista. So you have to understand, and I'll explain this in a minute, but uh, in more detail, but in a denomination, anytime someone leaves, it is headquarters. Headquarters are the ones who then casts about and finds people to take the church, and then they find a place for you to go. It all has to do with headquarters. That, that, is not, that, that was never done from a local church. Our church planting is not like that. Our church planting, it is family. It is, it is, they're a part of us. So if someone is going to leave and do something else, this is our baby. So we don't apply to, hey, can you put an ad in the Foursquare Times or whatever their magazine might be, see if you can find a, a paper, is who is going to take that? The only option is we're going to do that from our own. And so for the very first time, we made church changes and that was Ron and Susie Burrell, who had been pioneering in Wickenburg, took the church in Flagstaff, Arizona. This was the very first church change that we ever made. We have some photos from Flagstaff. That is the Flagstaff congregation. You see it a, was a church building that was originally a four-square building. Here is a, a float that they entered in Flagstaff. That's Ron Burrell, who was the pastor, he was the original hippie who was saved, was the first one planted out of our congregation. He then became the pastor. And so that was a milestone of church changes. This is why local church planting is so crucial. Because if you are connected to a pastor who knows you, a pastor who cares for you, then he can help guide you in church planting. Not every church uh, that we plant goes fantastic. So there are struggles. You have pastors, they're struggling. They can be stirred or they can struggle for various reasons. They can feel I need to leave for uh, many reasons or they can be frustrated. If you are connected to a local church, and a pastor, he knows you. There are some men, they have like spiritual ADD. They want to move every week. No, you need to stay there. There are other men, a pastor who loves you. Yes, I, I, that bears witness in my spirit. Uh, you need to, uh, to move. I, I travel now. When I travel, sometimes I get pastors and they're like, you know, I'm thinking, I, and they're asking me, what do you think? Should I move? I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. That, that's what a pastor is for. I'm not your pastor. I can help my men. You need to talk to your pastor. But what this brings in our fellowship is we're all in this together. This is not a machine. It's not just an organization. We're all in this together. That brings shared responsibilities. That means that pastors who, who take a church, they have to respond to God's leading. If God stirs or leads an existing pastor to go somewhere else, it's on them to respond and say, yes, God, I'll do your will. On the other hand is that I want to go. Maybe you're just frustrated. Uh, or we don't have a, a, an option right now. No, you need to stay. That is pastors, they have a responsibility. Congregations have to flow with uh, what God is doing. Sometimes 
uh, church changes, pastoral changes are, are no fun. You have people that they got saved under a man. They, they feel they owe something to him. And so, uh, so they fight God's will. The, the new guy comes in. He's not doing anything wrong. He's just not the old guy. And so we have people in church there fighting him. You're the Antichrist. Why? Because you're not my old pastor. That's not going to work. That doesn't help in the overall and then, of course, the third shared responsibility is disciples. We have men that uh, we, we plant men out. In the highest likelihood, they will pioneer. But they have to be open. If there is a need, that is God's will. And uh, you have to be willing to change your mind and respond. Responding to need is a valid way of finding God's will. And so all of these together... Over time, in every conference, you will see new churches planted, but you will see church changes where a man goes overseas or he goes to pioneer in a new city or for whatever reason there's a change. Other people move into that. The very first time that happened was in Flagstaff, Arizona. Okay, we're going to move on now in our history. If we were a part of Foursquare, why aren't we still with them? And that is a lengthy tale that developed over time. We're going to start and we're going to talk about the first denominational tensions. That's the lesson we're going to talk about. Very important word, denomination. The Foursquare Gospel Church is a denomination. What is a denomination? You look in the dictionary, it means a group of churches with common beliefs marked by centralized control and that is very important we are not a denomination we're a fellowship we'll talk about that and define that later on but denomination is what we're talking about now denomination is all about centralized control and it has to do with three very important areas number one how do you get new pastors? How are new pastors trained and entered the ministry? The denomination controls that. You go to Bible school. My father was saved in a local church in Phoenix, went to his pastors and said, I believe God wants me to preach. They gave him the only answer they knew. You have to go to Life Bible College, which is the denomination's central Bible school, you graduate there and they will determine your ministry from then on. So denomination, centralized control is training pastors. Number two has to do with missions. I believe God wants me to be a missionary and go overseas. You go to the central missions board. They have uh, 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 an, a part of their organization is simply dealing with missions. You apply, you are, uh, you know, uh, they might ask you questions and determine your fitness. The mission board determines that. Your pastor doesn't do it. It's the mission board, and many times, these are people, you have no idea who these people are. You don't know them, they don't know you, you put in a written application, they had an interview, they agree or disagree, they send, they're the ones who support. All money for missions only goes to the central board. Local churches are not the ones who send the money. All they do is they send to central mission board and they go. The third is church planting and this is where now, we're going to see this cause tension. In every church around the world, you have pastors that decide to go somewhere else. You have pastors that quit. You have pastors that die. Have, for whatever reason, churches come open. So who decides who pastors there? In a denomination, you have either central headquarters or then they break it up into districts. In Foursquare, they had what they called districts it was the district supervisor in the southwest there was somebody for arizona and included california and different places they are the ones who determine who 
gets to take these churches or who gets to pastor at all. So now we come, having given you that background, in our early days, trying to fill their churches because the downside of centralized control is you wind up having a lot of open churches because you don't know people personally. So they had a lot of open churches. Foursquare allowed us to fill some of their existing churches because my father started telling the powers that be, listen, I have these young couples. They are full of the life and fire of God. They are ready to go, but they haven't gone to Bible school. In Foursquare, the only way you become a pastor is Bible school. So this was actually revolutionary on Foursquare's part. They were willing to put some of our unschooled men in because they had no options. This actually solved a problem. I have an empty church. I told you when my dad came, they didn't have a pastor here for three months. We have an empty church. Okay, you got a young guy, put them uh, in. And so God bless Foursquare for allowing that, but knowing human nature, I predict none of the churches that our guys took were fantastic uh, finds. They were lower ranked. They were very few people, run down buildings. The probable expectation is these young untrained guys are going to struggle like the trained four square guys have struggled for years, but now there comes a problem. Many of them didn't struggle. Many of them didn't fail. The churches grew. The churches succeeded numerically without going to Bible school. So on our part, that's like fantastic. They're having revival in Phoenix and Flagstaff and Tucson. That's wonderful. You have to understand now, this created tension in Foursquare. Tension number one, the success of disciple pastors threatened the foundations. Imagine you're a Foursquare pastor. You paid money to, to become a pastor, right? You paid money to get a degree, to go to school. You worked for years to graduate and qualify. And then knowing human nature, people like letters behind their name, right? A PhD, and I don't remember what it is for ministry. It's a D ministry or a D M I N or something. I don't know what it is. So what does that say? Now these men who, that's the system, and now you start hearing these young guys who have never gone to school and the church is growing and they're having about, what does that say about all of your years of money and effort? Did I, I wasted my money? I wasted my time going to school? I went to school, I'm struggling. This guy, he was on drugs a couple of years ago. <laughs> and now he's growing. Imagine you are a four-square pastor who now is a professor at Bible school. And now Wayman Mitchell is freely telling people Bible school is not the way to train men for ministry. So this caused tension. This was not, they were not clapping at this. They were upset at this. Tension number two was the tension of territory. I, I gather from the Foursquare system, anybody that had a little bit of numerical success, they made you the, the district supervisor or the area supervisor. So, this is not unique to Foursquare. It's true in every organization in the world. You get people, this is not just a job or a ministry. This is a kingdom. This is my area. And so what happened is we had men that were supervisors who felt that an entire area, an entire state, an entire region, this, this is mine, so now, Wayman Mitchell, young hick pastor from Prescott, he starts saying, I want to plant a church in a city in your area. And common reaction was, I've had my eye on that city. Yeah, yeah but that means nothing. <laughs> and so Pastor Mitchell dared to plant men in their area. 
and said, how dare you plant men in my area? And uh, so that caused a tension. And then, of course, supervisors now, they felt they were in charge. The men that we sent, it's relational. They know Pastor Mitchell. They know he cares for them. He's the one who got them saved, trained them. He's the one who's helped them through numerous crises. Now, Pastor Mitchell plants them in an area where a four-square supervisor, they don't know this guy. But this guy feels he's in charge, so he starts giving them orders. And how many of you know some of the first men we sent, they were a little rough around the edges. <laughs> they did not receive orders well. <laughs> they didn't play well with others. They did not receive orders well. And in fairness to Foursquare, I apologize to you all. Many of them were very rude in refusing it. They told them exactly what they thought of their orders. And so this caused simmering tensions in Foursquare. Our church planting was the beginning of tension between what they called the Arizona Fellowship and Foursquare. I, I will expand on that in, in uh, later lessons because it was a gradual uh, process. I've got time for one more thing I want to tell you. I think last week I, I told you about the work in Mexico. Our churches in Mexico are a miracle. Our churches in Mexico came about by, if you look at it in human terms, by accident. We planted in Nogales, Arizona. Remember the building that we bought? Uh, my, my dad missed the clause that you couldn't actually occupy it for another six months. So, in the meantime, what do we do is they started a work in Mexico, in Nogales, uh, Sonora, Mexico, and that began, a, that's a miracle. God began to do miracles. Uh, our churches are built on conversions, and conversion is a miracle. What we need is we need the Holy Spirit to do what we can't do. I travel, men ask me, how do you get people Save, how do you get them locked in? A miracle, that's what it takes. So we do all we can do. We believe in evangelism. We do outreaches. We take it outside the four walls. We do all that. But God is in control of salvation. I want to tell you, sometimes salvation will surprise us. Here's one, one story uh, I'll leave you with in Mexico. Uh, the Jack Harris, who was pastoring both churches in uh, Nogales, Arizona, and Sonora, he began doing crusades. That's a... Story maybe for another time. Started doing healing crusades and word spread. So we started in other places. We got churches out of them in Obregón and in uh, different areas where it did crusades. But the word began to spread of what God was doing. One day he got a letter from a lady in a small village uh, down in Mexico and asked him, please, Next time you are going through, would you stop? I need to talk to you. And so for whatever reason, he did. This was a very tiny village. Uh, I don't remember what George told me, a thousand people, very, very small, is the Catholic priest left, and for a long time, they didn't have anybody to replace him, so they left a nun in charge. So the nun began ministering to people in the Catholic faith as best she can, but the nun started reading the Bible. <laughs> and when the nun started reading the Bible, she found that Jesus said, you must be born again. The Catholic nun got saved. <laughs> and so she, yeah, this is a miracle. Not only did she get saved when she started ministering in the Catholic Church, she started telling people, you must be born again. And the people in the church all got saved. She keeps reading the Bible and she said, in God's word, he doesn't want us to worship him with idols. The Catholic Church is filled with idols and holy pictures. So she said, we need to get rid of them all. They got a truck and took down every holy picture, every statue. <laughs> Imagine this. And they dumped them at the city garbage dump. 
this was the lady who asked Jack Harris, would you come? And she tells him the story. She says, someday they're going to send somebody here. I'm going to be in big trouble. <laughs> and she said, I need you to pray for me. So I, I just tell that story is if we are faithful to do God's will, I'm telling you, God will surprise us. Because this is, a, this is a work of God. It's not a plan, I think, and I want, I'm gonna. Is when we are obedient to God, God gets involved. That is the miracle of our churches in Mexico. I think I told you uh, last week is, uh, what is it, 436 or... Uh, churches in Mexico, uh, 17 nations be, beyond Mexico. What we're involved in is a miracle. And if we are trying our best to get people saved, and if we're trying our best to be obedient to what God tells us, we can believe that the Holy Spirit will come in. He will do far more than we can ever do. That is a lesson that's not just for Mexico. That's a lesson for your life. If you want to do God's will and you're doing all you can to try to get people saved, you never know God may surprise you with what he'll do through your life. Isn't that wonderful? Thank God. Amen. We are going to stop there and uh, then we're going to move on in uh, the morning service, 1030. God bless you.